to week two of Explore Classroom Special Edition Photo Camp Live. Uh, I'm Andrew Brennan, an education fellow at National Geographic and your host every Friday at 2 p.m. as we learn from some of the best photographers on the planet. Uh, together, we'll explore how photography is a powerful tool to understand the world around us, as well as our own personal journey. We'll learn how images can cultivate empathy, understanding, and connection with others, and in doing so, help to overcome adversity and injustice. It was Studs Terkel who said, the act of telling one's story is an act that enlarges democracy. So here's how it works. Each week, we will be joined by two National Geographic explorers who work in different corners of the planet to hear about their work, as well as trade secrets that they've learned along the way. You'll have a chance to ask your questions directly with these photographers, so come prepared. And, and this is the really fun part, each week we'll announce a photo assignment that you can take part in. Uh, we wanna hear your stories and experiences. Join us on Instagram using the hashtag PhotoCampLive, and you can submit up to three photos taken during your assignment for one, of our photo, for one of our National Geographic explorers to review and potentially have your work featured on next week's broadcast. You can find the link to the submission form in the chat in the YouTube description or on natgeoed.org slash explorer classroom. At the end of today's broadcast, we'll share some of the photos that you submitted last week. If you remember, last week we were joined by Asha Stewart and Erica Larson. They challenged us to capture images that tell the story of connection, connection to people, to each other, to our planets, and to yourselves. This week, we're joined by National Geographic explorers Federico Pardo and Malaika Vaz. Their work focuses on wildlife in the natural world, how humans interact with that world, and what it will take for us to protect and preserve the true wonder of our planet. So, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Federico and Malaika. And Federico, let's start with you. Here we go. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Hello, Malaika. I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually driving back from the jungle to home in Bogota and eventually in the U.S. I just fil finished filming for 50 days in, the, in a couple of regions of Colombia that I'm going to talk about a little, little bit ago. And I'm sorry if there's a little bit of noise, but I'm actually getting my car washed after this crazy adventure. Uh, I'm Federico Pardo, I'm from Colombia. I'm a National Geographic Explorer, but I also studied biology and I did a master's in uh, filmmaking. So I now work more on the outreach side of things, doing documentaries, photography, rather than um, actual science. And my current project, it's called Vanishing Primates. And um, after we talk about Malaika and whatnot, I'm gonna show you some of the first images that I did as part of my, my uh, endeavor. And uh, it's sort of a, a little world premiere because uh, they're right fresh of the camera on my computer, not even processed videos, just like images, raw images. So I'm very excited to share that and uh, I'm very happy to, see, to be here. How about you, Malaika? How are you doing? I'm doing really good and I'm so excited to see some of your images today. So I'm calling in from the West Coast of India, from Goa. And to tell you a little bit about my work, I'm a wildlife filmmaker and presenter. And the focus of my work is documenting the impact of humans on the natural world. So as part of my National Geographic Early Career Grant, I created a three-part series on big cats that will be broadcast on National Geographic channel this August. And we have a sneak peek as well um, later on today. Um, besides that, I also love documenting stories of endangered species that don't usually get their time in the sun, their time on television. And that's everything from red pandas to purple frogs to king cobras. And the part of my work that I'm actually going to be focusing on today is um, telling stories about wildlife trafficking and conservation issues. So I'm really excited and thank you so much for everyone for joining in today. Wow, that's great. Well, I think we now go to present our work. This is when it starts. Let's see if the... Yeah, there goes the video feed. Okay, I think it's running now. I don't think I see it here.
Perfect. So that's me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I started with this image so, just so I know that you'll stay here through the end of the talk. I'm going to talk about how I ended up atop a tree filming monkeys. Uh, but for my first project, um, if you can please continue, Jess, I'm going to talk about a short essay I did on ice shanties or ice fishing houses. These are um, houses like this one that pop up every winter in several parts of the U.S. This series I did in Vermont. I lived there for a couple of years. And of course, coming from Colombia, uh, which is in the tropics, no winter, seeing these houses uh, pop up on a frozen lake was, it was something. I, 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 I was curious. I wanted to know who was crazy enough to just get out in the ice to fish in the middle of the winter. I started photographing the houses at night. I thought that would add, that would contribute to the overall ethereal atmosphere of the, of the lake, of the activity. And then during the day, I would go out and uh, try to photograph more of the still lives, the fishes, the traps, the snow, textures around the, the area. And uh, I chose this essay because given the current circumstances of uh, the virus and how we need to be in a little bit of a lockdown, I wanted to say that you don't need to go too far to document your relationship with nature. This was a pond nearby, like a couple of blocks where I used to live in Brattleboro, Vermont. And uh, I just had to walk down the, 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 the river to get to the pond and it was frozen and photograph whatever was happening there. So later on, when Malaika um, explains the assignment, we're gonna ask you to document what's around you and your, your relationship with nature. Um, for me, of course, this became more of a personal project because it talks about the night, uh, the people, the environment, the snow, sort of being lonely in this new culture. Uh, you can see uh, these are night photographs. Uh, you can see the sky is dark and it, 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 the image allows, maybe you can see some of the stars. Um, so I would go out there every night, not every night, when I was in Vermont, roughly around nine, in, nine at night and stayed until midnight just because it was too cold and walk around the eyes, look for my subjects doing this quote unquote clinical portraits, meaning I would just choose one house, take a few photos, go further, go closer, see what works. The same with the fishes, try to see what species are there, take a photo of the fish on the snow, maybe turn it around. This one I actually turned around so I could see the snow um, stuck on the fish. So even though it's, something that happens naturally. I modified a couple of things just so I could capture more textures and more what I felt about this place, you know? Um, this beautiful uh, winter light, long shadows. So it's just a small study of this human nature interaction that I found. It took me roughly three years to put together just because I didn't spend all the time in Vermont. So every time I would be there, I would take advantage and go photograph. And this is something you can do with your community garden or your own backyard or the, the park by your house. Go photograph all the birds or all the trees or all the flowers or see how many insects you can find and start doing this indexical or this classification of nature of where you live. Um, I wanted to include the human element to this story, but unfortunately, when I try to interact with the fishermen and the, the people who are here, uh, you know, they, they normally want to go fishing by themselves. It was sort of a lonely endeavor and I couldn't really break through. But uh, a few months later, or actually last year, the Ver Vermont Folk Life Center, which is a small museum uh, in Middlebury, Vermont, reached out to me and said, hey, we love your images. We want to do something together. Uh, why don't we work on a multimedia exhibit? And we made it happen. Uh, I put, I, they used, or we used my images. We created a nice selection of images and the Folk Life Center conducted interviews with the owners of the fishermen. They had better access, they knew some of them from before, and together we were able to put together a very nice exhibit. And uh, right now it's in Middlebury and it hopefully it's gonna be in Brattleboro, Vermont in a couple of months. So little projects that can eventually grow up into something more meaningful for your community. And for my next project, which is uh, actually the, the most interesting one or current one, I'm gonna talk about vanishing primates. This is what I'm working on as a National Geographic Explorer here in Colombia. And uh, the grant is meant to document and save Colombia's three most endangered monkeys. The cotton top tamarind on the left, the brown spider monkey in the middle, and the Kakita titi monkey. 
These are the three most endangered monkeys of Colombia. All of them are critically endangered. And also they have been over the past few years among the 25 most endangered monkeys in the planet. So this is very urgent. And the way I want to save them is building an immersive multimedia experience. I imagine them like these pop-up theaters, these boxes where people can walk in. And when, you work, when you're inside, uh, next, just this, um, it's going to be sort of like a multimedia immersive jungle. It's going to be like you walking inside the forest where the monkeys live. We're going to have surround system, very involving. And the idea is to bring an experience to storytelling and promote tangible conservation actions. So as you can see, for every person that goes into the cube, into the theater, we're going to plant one tree in the monkey's ecosystem. And the idea behind this is that I wanted to do a media project that had a tangible conservation action. And I want to, I want to emphasize on this because right now, more than ever, we need to focus our energies into making this a better planet. Um, and that's what I'm doing. That's a photo of my car uh, crossing an Amazonian river a couple of weeks ago on two canoes. Uh, so quite an adventure, quite an expedition. I don't think I've done that before. And the journey was supposed to take me to the northern part of Colombia, up in the red box, then to the middle part. Uh, that's where the brown spider monkey lives. And then to the southern part in the Amazon. But unfortunately, due to the virus, I was only able to go to the two locations that are highlighted on green the Magdalena River Valley to film the brown spider monkey and the foothills between the Andes and the Amazon where the Calcutta monkey lives. Um, these two monkeys, so a little bit of a sad news because the cotton top is beautiful, but the good news is that I've worked with them before. I have footage of them so I can still use it. And uh, this is me again a couple of weeks ago. As you can see, I'm very excited about what I did and uh, being on a tree for a few days at a time waiting to see the monkeys. Together with a couple of colleagues, we built these platforms roughly 90 feet or 100 feet above uh, the ground level. Uh, I'm in the middle of the Amazonian jungle, spending up to 10 hours a day uh, with mosquitoes and sun and rain, whatever it takes, we get the job done. Just so we can film the monkeys and bring very intimate images, right? I want to be able to be close at their eye level. This is the pygmy marmoset, one of... Uh, Amer the Amer one of the smallest monkeys in the world. It's smaller than the size of your hand, maybe four inches long. So beautiful, tiny little guy. And being this close, being at their eye level, uh, allows me to be intimate, allows me to bring you to their own world. So when we give you the assignment at the end, think if you have this special place where you can see more wildlife or nature, maybe a tree house that has some bird feeders around, or maybe a little garden nearby, or if you have a composting bean, maybe if you open it and you see, you see some worms, things that don't necessarily need to be too far, but you can still document you and the relationship to nature. Sorry, them and your relationship to nature. And uh, excuse me if the video quality is a little choppy, but these images are straight from the memory cards a couple of days ago. Uh, the Saddleback Tamarin just taking a huge leap of all the monkeys we filmed. This is the guy that takes the largest uh, jumps in between branches uh, in relationship to its size. So pretty acrobatic animal. We filmed them in slow motion, running up and down the trees, feeding, grooming, very beautiful behaviors. And as you can see, being at their level, it's a really cool vantage point. Um, in the next video, or in the next few videos, we're going to see also some um, small clips that haven't been processed or anything of uh, the monkeys I filmed. This is a woolly monkey, a mother with its baby. Hopefully you can see it there. Uh, I purposely picked jumping shots, which have a little bit of tension to them. Um, but we also want to look for the special bonding moments, right? A mama and a baby of a woolly monkey. This is a subspecies that's critically endangered as well. Um, next video, please. So right now I'm in the I would say I'm finishing my project, but I'm actually starting it because I have all the footage and now I just have to put together the exhibit, the multimedia exhibit that the public is gonna see. Um, if we can keep going on, that's another brown spider monkey from the Magdalena River Valley with a little baby. It was a two month old, very, very rare to see. And I wanted to highlight that I didn't do this by myself. I had a team of colleagues and friends who helped me throughout the journey in different parts. I would hire different people. 
Um, and these colleagues are instrumental to make things happen. Malaika, I'm sure when you do your, your shows, you work with different people, directors, sound guys, camera guys, photographers, fixers, producers, all sorts of people that make this happen. So I do too have a team. Um, we can go further with the slides, Jess. Um, so I just wanted to include some of their shots here. The people who helped me build the, the, the platforms, people who are experts on climbing and rigging and, and security, working at night uh, under the rain. So you have people were helping with the lights, with the umbrella. And this is very important because maybe your neighbors, your friends in school, your friends, your cousin, your brothers, your sisters, whoever, they're also into photography. So go out with them, start exploring the world and help each other to get better photos. And last but not least, also look into your, um, into those organizations that may be in your community. My project was gladly funded by National Geographic and I also received support from Red Cameras. But I'm working super closely with uh, two NGOs, Projecto Primates and Projecto Titi, who are gonna be doing the conservation part of my project. They are the ones in charge of planting the trees, knowing which are the forests that we need to connect and all that stuff. And these are relationships that I've been working with for eight years. These are um, friends that I know for eight years and that I, we've fostered a professional relationship that brought us together here. So my um, invitation is that you look around your neighborhood, your community, your city, which are the, the organizations that you'd like to work with and reach out. Maybe they have internships or volunteer opportunities. Maybe you can do media for them, some photos or some videos. And eventually, maybe five, 10 years from now, they will become your first clients. And together, hopefully you can make a better place for your community. So that's me. So and thank you for joining. And um, I think, Malaika, it's your turn. Thank you, Federico. And I'm honestly so impressed by some of those images. And what I find really cool about them is that so many of them were taken right in your backyard. I mean, that is super inspiring at a time like this. So moving on, I am going to be opening up my keynote. One second. Can you see it? Can you see it, Federico? I think there's a bit of an issue. All right. Then I think I can see it well. There you go. Okay, cool. So as a wildlife filmmaker and photographer, a lot of my work focuses on marine trafficking and issues that are about how people interact with the natural world. But the reason I have this picture up here first is because I think it's really important to tell stories that you are passionate about. It's important to tell stories of animals that you are in love with, places that you really, really respect and have grown up loving, and also places that you might have fallen in love with you know, in the recent years. So this is a picture of me um, free diving with a manta ray off the coast of the Maldives in an atoll. And some of the pictures that you will see after this are a bit sad, but I think it's important to always come from the perspective of knowing why you take photographs to begin with. So a lot of my photography is in India, on the west coast of India and on the east coast of India. This particular image was taken while we were doing a film shoot um, on the west coast. So to begin with, I think I'd like to show you this one picture. This is a picture of a fishing market very, very close to where I live in Bangalore. And what I found interesting about this picture was that I really wanted to communicate how extractive and how destructive our ocean resources um, our, our fishing is because so many of our ocean resources are constantly taken away at a rate that is so, so high that they can't replenish themselves. And fish like these are really, really targeted. But when I first decided to take the photograph, I was standing high up at this angle. And I took like 10 photographs and then 15 and then 20 and none of them worked out fine. But then eventually I decided to get down, get dirty um, at the fishing market. And I got this image, which kind of shows um, the scale of the issue. Uh, these images are interesting to me because they are of manta rays being killed. This is a project that I've been doing for the last four years now, documenting the illegal trafficking of manta rays across Southeast Asia. This one particular picture was of a fisherman right after he got a manta ray and he pulled it out of his net and kept it on his boat. What is interesting is that this picture, if you look at it closely, the person in focus is the fisherman, really. I mean, you're looking at his action, you're looking at the way he's moving, what he's doing. But the next picture is from the very same boat, the very same day, literally a second after. And it is a picture of a manta ray on its own. And I think that's interesting from a composition perspective, because when you're taking a photograph, you always have the option of 
focusing on different aspects of the story. So try to think about who you want to bring out or which animal you want to focus on and then get down to their eye level. I think getting down to someone's eye level is always a really, really good tip to keep in mind. Um, with this particular manta ray, when I got down to its eye level, I was able to see not just the animal and its eye, which is kind of, you know, lifeless at this point, but also the broader context of the fishing boat of other fishing boats in the distance. This is another photograph that I took on a GoPro. So you don't need to have a fancy camera in order to be a photographer. You can take it on really simple cameras. You can take it on your phone as well. These are also images of manta rays from different fishing ports across India. And this is part of also a much larger research and conservation project in India, where we're trying to get man rays legal protection. So as a photographer, I think it's important to kind of think about how you want your films to create an impact in the world. What is the final output that you're thinking of when you take those photographs? Because those photographs can make a difference, but you need to know what difference you're trying to make to begin with. This is an image of one of the traders of manta rays. And I decided to use this particular angle because I wanted to show both um, his perception of you know, me coming in there and taking a photograph and also um, the, the gill plates, which, which is what the manta rays breathe with underwater in the backdrop. These are pictures of children on um, India's East Coast. These kids have grown up seeing sharks and manta rays being killed. For them, this is the normal. Um, this is the norm in every single way. So taking these photographs, I really wanted to capture them in their element, very comfortable, very natural. So one of the things I think is really important as a tip for everyone watching today is that when you're going in to tell a story, try to get your subject, try to get the person you're taking a photograph of really com comfortable. Spend a couple of days a couple of hours, whatever you can afford to, um, talking to them, getting to know them, letting them be comfortable with your presence so that when you do take a photograph, they are completely themselves and they are pretending to be anyone else in that moment. These are some more photographs of those same kids. This photograph is of a shark that was killed a few minutes before I took this photograph. And um, I, what I find interesting about this is that I was trying to establish that you know, these sharks are really threatened and that humans kind of are threatening them as a result of the fact that we see them as um, inferior to us in ways, or we kind of have this dominance over the natural world. And this image of this man's feet kind of standing um, just right there and the shark in between his feet spoke to me about the fact that, you know, these animals are very low in terms of our priority and we really need to be able to value them if we want to protect them. So think about composition when you're trying to tell a story because I think composition can make a huge, huge difference. And also as a photographer, try to get uncomfortable, get down there. I mean, as you can tell, this is not the most comfortable place to be for someone who's taking a photograph, but in that moment, it allowed me to take the right picture and tell the story. This again is another situation where I literally um, went in there, requested them to like um, allow me to take photographs of them. And then I got a picture of a transaction where two traders were paying each other for the shock that you just saw a few seconds before. So I think it's important to kind of get in there always, um, make sure that people are listening to what you're saying, and also try to make sure that when you're taking a photograph, you're really immersing yourself because you immerse yourself, people will pay attention, people will listen to your stories because you were right there in the heart of the action. This is a photograph um, that I took when I was in a fishing vessel. Uh, it was a photograph of this uh, turtle that was being released back. So these turtles get caught up in fishing nets very often. And unfortunately, um, a lot of them do die. But the ones that do survive when they're pulled up by fishermen are thrown back into the water. And it's a really inspiring story to see these fishermen saving these turtles. Um, what I think is important to remember about this photograph is that I think I spent about 15 days living on a fishing vessel before I got this photograph. So sometimes it takes time. It takes longer than 15 days. Sometimes it takes months and months until you get that photograph. And if you're really, really passionate about telling that story, you um, have to be ready for that. You have to be ready to invest that time in and spend you know, time looking for that subject and waiting for that moment to happen. And I think for all of the students who are listening and all of the people who will be taking photographs in the days ahead, if you're trying to take a photograph of an animal in an ecosystem or of a moment in time, um, spend a lot of time waiting, try to understand the behavior of the animal, because I think that when you understand the behavior of the animal, you can predict what its movements will be. And when you can predict what its movements will be, you will usually be able to kind of gauge when to take a photograph. These your your are turtles are my monkeys. Sorry, I had to turn. Oh, <laughs> 
So this next photograph is of a Neil guy or um, a blue bull in India that was killed because of um, a road that went through its habitat. So I think when you want to cover stories that are very big picture issues like roads and development or climate change or global warming, sometimes it's a bit overwhelming as a young person, but I would say, try to think about what the small story is for that big picture issue. Right, so if it is climate change, who is it that is being impacted by that climate change? Is that a fisher person? Is that an agriculture um, provider? Is that someone who is uh, a trader? Is that someone who is your grandmother? Whoever that person is, try to tell that story through their lens. And for me, um, this animal was the lens to tell a story about um, development in the region. This too was in Thar Desert and also talks about unsustainable development. Um, getting towards the end, but here's a photograph of someone I really find inspiring. He's a conservationist in India who has saved 10,000 hectares of degraded mangrove land over the course of his lifetime. And he's done that by replanting mangrove saplings and doing really of mobilizing his entire community. So if you decide to take a portrait as part of your assignment, I think what's important to remember is that you've kind of got to get um, a shot of the person in their natural element, right? So if you're taking a photograph of someone who's, say, a surfer, um, trying to get them at the beach, in their element, doing what they do, um, really brings the story out in an interesting way. And lastly, there, these are some pictures of um, the wildlife trade in Hong Kong and China. And these photos were actually taken on my phone because I was filming undercover. So in situations where I couldn't obviously be, you know, taking my camera out. So some of them were taken covertly, some of them were taken when no one was looking. Um, and these photographs of things like different kinds of seahorses being killed or whale sharks killed. Um, tell the story of wildlife trafficking in a way that is really, that hits home because I've been diving since I was 11 years old and I have never seen a seahorse in the wild, maybe once in the distance. But here you have a picture where you have thousands and thousands of them in this store in China. And lastly, um, the project that I'm working on right now is on the migrant crisis in India due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as a result of the pandemic, the entire country has been shut down. And what's happened is that a lot of people who work in the informal sector have lost their jobs. So this was something that was a first for me because I am a wildlife filmmaker. And the reason I'm showing you these pictures is because I think that at this time, I mean, these are crazy times where no one saw this coming. But what is good to remember is that you can get outside of your comfort zone. I think it's okay to be a beginner. It's okay to experiment and it's okay to do things for the first time because that's what I did with this project. Tell a story about a community that is not related to wildlife for the first time. And it really was one of the most fulfilling projects. So yes, that is my presentation and thank you. Wow, that was great. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I think, I think now we're going to present the assignment, right? What we want them to do over the next few days. Yeah, for sure. So I was going to say that, you know, before we get into the assignment, I think the theme that we are looking at is nature. I think what you saw with Federico's work and with my work, the biggest theme right now is documenting nature. And I think that's especially pertinent from the perspective of COVID-19, because this pandemic was caused by the wildlife trade. So if you think about it from that perspective, this is a really, really good time to be telling stories about the natural world, because people are increasingly aware about it. So to get into the assignment, basically the assignment is to create a photo story and to take photographs of nature in your backyard. So ecosystems around you, stories of wildlife, stories of how people connect with the natural world. Um, what I would like to say is that with this assignment, when you're taking photographs of nature, it's really, really important that you don't kind of focus only on nature that is really far away because you can tell stories that are literally in your garden or stories that can be in the national park next to you or at a fishing market like some of the photographs that I've been taking over the last couple of years. Um, what's also important is to stay safe right now. I mean, if you're going out into places where there are people, what I would say is wear protective gear, sanitize your equipment, um, make sure that you're keeping safe because that's one of the most important things right now. And one of the tips that I would give you is that if you're taking photographs of, you know, nature around you, try to go out during the golden hour, which is the hour right after sunrise and right before 
um, sunset. So that's when you would get really, really interesting pictures. That's when you would get pictures that kind of um, are really good from a color perspective. So a couple of ideas for assignments that you could potentially do. You could do an assignment where you go out there and take a photograph of a community leader of yours in a natural setting. You could do an assignment about smaller bugs, about textures and plants. You could do an assignment where you talk about issues that are about environmental change. I think what's important is to kind of be representative of what's the reality on the ground. And I think the biggest reality is that, you know, our planet is changing, our planet is threatened. So for example, if you are taking a photograph of an ecosystem and there's a lot of garbage there, right? Um, it seems natural to kind of cut that out of the frame, but as photo photographers, as storytellers, I think it's really, really important to be able to tell the bigger story, the bigger picture. So feel free to kind of tell the story of the conservation issue of, you know, how communities are being impacted. And what I would also say is that when you submit this assignment, you will also be um, putting it up on Instagram, you will be sharing it on multiple platforms. So think about the messaging you want to get in terms of the caption, right? Because the photograph, of course, is really, really important. It's the bulk of what people are drawn into. But what you say through the caption is equally important because it kind of gives you a sense of what the photographer was thinking at the moment, what the broader circumstances were, um, what the subject might have been thinking, an interesting quote that you might have got from someone you took a photograph of. So while you're thinking about the visual element of it, think about the storytelling aspect of it as well, because when those two come together, you've got an amazing, amazing story. Um, I'm just going to read out the aspect that um, is regarding the submission of the photographs. So if you would like to share your photographs and images and experiences on Instagram, you can use the hashtag, hashtag photo camp live. Um, and if you're interested in having your work reviewed by myself and Federico um, for a feature in next week's session, please come back to this YouTube video and find the image submission form in the video description. The submission form is also available through the Explorer Classroom page on natgeoed.org slash Explorer Classroom. Um, and one of the things that I would say to you as you go about getting that photograph is that remember that your story matters so much today. Being a young person and taking photographs is something that is amazing. We need more young people to be taking photographs. I'm 23. And I've been taking photographs and taking videos and making films since I was 18 now. So I think that you're never too young to start. You could start at five, you could start at seven. You're never too young to start as long as you have the passion for the story and you have an idea of what impact you want to have in the world when you put that photograph out. Wow, I hope people were taking notes during those two presentations. So much great advice packed into such a short period of time. Uh, Federico, your reminder for us to search for texture and the different techniques to find the nature that's all around us and Malaika for you, just how you're using different cameras and different settings and your reminder on the time of day that might be best for photographing nature. Just thank you so much to both of you. Um, I think now we're going to move into the question and answer portion. And so for those of you that are watching live, uh, please go ahead and add some questions to the chat if you have questions for Malaika or Federico. Um, I, they'd be super excited to answer. Um, but first, we have some young people that are joining us uh, here on camera. So I'm going to go ahead and ask them to turn on their cameras. Um, and we'll go to their questions first. So let's start with Alana. And Alana, if you could just say where you're from as well before asking your question. Um, hi guys, uh, my name is Alana, I'm from Ireland um, and it's so great to be here. Um, thank you Malaika and Federico for such an insightful um, introduction to your work. Um, I cannot wait to learn more about you. Um, I suppose my my big question, and you, 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 you kind of answered it, um, but I suppose connections with community um, when you're doing photography it's so important um and i imagine that connecting with animals can be a bit of a challenge obviously <laughs> there's a bit of a language barrier there um so how do you um how do you i suppose like obviously time and patience but how do you like stay safe with animals but also make sure you're telling their story in an authentic way that people will really grab onto So I think one aspect that I would touch upon with animals is that 
as you spend more time learning about wildlife, that really makes a huge difference. I mean, not just when you get to the location, but even before doing your background research. I mean, before I go on a shoot, I usually spend a week reading every single research paper that I can get my hands on to understand how an animal behaves in the wild, because then that kind of gives you a sense of, you know, how close you should be, how far you should be. I think one of the most important things is also to be um, cognizant of the animal safety. Of course, your safety is really important, but sometimes as a photographer, you can get really excited and get up close and personal. Um, and that could disturb the animal, especially if it's a young one. So just being aware of that is really important. And then from a community perspective, I spent a lot of time working with communities. And I think it's important to kind of go in there and tell them about what your project is about. Um, explain that, you know, you're a young photographer, you are just getting started, you're experimenting and that, you know, you want to tell a story about how they connect with the natural world. So just coming in there with that humility, with that, um, you know, sense of just being friends with them first really, really helps. What I would also recommend doing is that um, when you spend more time with that community, you will probably get an insight into how they see things. Keep speaking to them. Even if you're doing a photography project, you know, you can interview them multiple times during the day because that will help you understand their story better. Um, and lastly, when you're done with a uh, a photography project, I really like to go back to the community whenever I can and give them prints of the photo and then take some more photographs. And it's just so exciting to see how they respond to that and how happy they are to see photographs of themselves. So it's not just about nurturing those relationships when you go on a shoot, but even after. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Malaika. The one thing I would uh, add is, of course, you want to take care of yourself and the, and the gear. So on one side, you can work with long lenses, telephoto lenses that allows you to zoom in without getting too close to the, a potentially dangerous animal. And also be aware of the weather conditions uh, in the Amazon or maybe in Ireland, I guess it rains also quite a bit. So make sure you bring out a shell, uh, an umbrella, a couple of things that will keep you warm, some candy. And yeah, uh, just <laughs> overall stay alive. Yeah, and, and very, is important. <laughs> I can only imagine some of the dangers that you're facing, you know, 90 feet up in a tree. Uh, you definitely need to know what the weather is going to be like and <laughs> around you. Um, among One thing that I would also add to that um, is also when you're working with wildlife, it's really important to be with someone who's much more experienced than you. I mean, I recently was making a documentary on Himalayan black bears and they can be pretty ferocious. And at one point we almost had a black bear charging at us with the cameras like literally a couple of feet away from it. But what really helped was that I was with a forest guard and that forest guard knew exactly how to kind of deflect the bear, get him a bit confused and move him away. So that's what saved my life that day. So I think that if you're a young person and you don't have too much experience with wildlife, go with someone who is more experienced. Absolutely. Amo, uh, did you want to go ahead and interview Let us know where you're from and ask a question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm from Maryland in the US. Um, and my question, so recently I made a video or I was just making video for the last 10 days. I was working straight. And uh, at the end of it, I didn't submit the video in time. It was for a competition. And I basically, you know, in, in my words, failed. So have you guys ever failed in the, or had like something like in, a, in an expedition or a video photo shoot? And if so, how did, uh, how did you guys handle it? All right. Uh, well, I think the word fail is a little tough on you. Um, we've all had those moments, maybe not on a specific project that you wanted to submit and you didn't re reach the deadline, but maybe you go out to film something and you didn't see it. Or you wanted to get this beautiful sequence of monkeys and you couldn't do it. I was going to go film the cotton top tamarins in the Caribbean coast, but I couldn't. So, I mean, what, what, what I would say is, I'm sure there will be other contests or other opportunities where you will be able to submit your film. I'm sure uh, your film can always get a little stronger. Uh, maybe if the 10 minute cut is a little watered down, maybe an eight minute cut, maybe a stronger cut, maybe have somebody else look at it. Uh, we're, we would be happy to look at it and give you some feedback. And um, this will be the stepping stone for something bigger or depending on the subject of your video, you can look into potential uh, social media accounts or institutions that would be interested in featuring it in their networks. So you already have something that you can share. Now use it. You haven't lost anything. You finished the video. That's hard enough. So mm -hmm. use it. 
I think also I would say that failure is really an opportunity to kind of be better. Um, I fail all the time. I mean, I've been making a film for the last three and a half years now. I thought that I would be done within the first year, but it's taken three and a half years and we're finally done as of last week. So sometimes th things take time, things don't go as planned. But I think what is really important is kind of having the perspective that regardless of what the circumstances are, you make the best out of that. And I think as a young filmmaker, I think what is really, really important is to gain exposure. So if you can kind of intern with other filmmakers, if you can work Work with people who are more experienced at this point in time. I think really think about the first couple of years of being a filmmaker as the learning years and just dive into immersing yourself into what it takes to make a film. And with the 10 minute film that you have, I mean, I would love to watch it. I think Federico and I would love to give you suggestions on that if you'd like and help you get it out to any platforms that are directed at young people. Thank you so much. And Amog, you're already doing the right thing, showing up here and continuing to explore and, and network in this community. Um, Diana, did you want to go ahead and ask your question and let us know where you're calling in from? Hi, my name is Diana. Uh, I'm from Mexico. And my question is if you could give to us some advices for composition in wildlife photography, because when we are in files, so sometimes it's difficult for us taking a, a good picture for, for the motion. So if you could give us uh, some advices. I'm sorry, I think uh, her voice cut off for a second. Could you please repeat that? <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, I, I am, I'm, my name is Diana. I'm from Mexico. And I want to know if you could give to us some advice for composition in wildlife photography. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I really try to keep in mind when I'm, you know, composing a photograph or composing even the frame for a video is that you want to put the subject into perspective, right? So for example, if you are taking a photograph of, um, say, a human or taking a photograph of, say, a bear in its natural surrounding, if you kind of center it, um, it can be a bit boring, but if you give it, put it towards the right side of the frame or the left side of the frame and leave enough breathing space, kind of you know show both the animal and its environment that can be really interesting and the other thing with composition as a photographer that I would say is that really try to get unique angles right so for example if you want to take a photograph of something spend maybe 20 minutes there and in the first five minutes you take you know regular photographs from like a top angle um, but then go down like get down there um, try to take a photograph from an interesting angle try to get you know something else in the foreground like you know a leaf in the foreground and the animal in the background I think those are interesting things that you can experiment with if you want to take a photo that has a good composition. <laughs> totally agree. I would add also a couple of things. One, hundreds of photos. Use what Malaika said, but take hundreds of photos because getting a great wildlife shot from a couple of images, it's hard. But getting a great wildlife shot of 500 images, you have higher odds. So don't be scared of shooting away. Secondly, I would also, when I think about wildlife images, I, I, there are roughly, roughly two categories. One, which is an ID shot or a, a photo that you can see which animal it is. It's a pigeon or it's a shark or it's a camel. A standing shot doesn't say much. And then the next category, it's looking at behaviors, moments, specific actions that are happening, right? taking flight, uh, singing, um, reading, uh, moving along. So you can use the motion of the camera and a slow shutter to pan and eventually capture that motion. So start looking now into behaviors uh, and follow one animal. Pick one animal and go for it, go for it. Even if it's a pigeon, it doesn't matter. Do the exercise of just following and eventually, once you find the proper perspective, the right light, the right behavior, the right uh, mood, focus is in place, and everything, you'll have a fantastic shot. Um, it takes time, but I'm sure you can make it. And especially important for you, you. As, you are, as these monkeys are flying through the air. <laughs> um, lots to consider. Um, okay, we have our last question from our on-screen participants with Rachel Bradley. If you could just let us know where you're from, Rachel, and go ahead and ask your question. Hello, I'm Rachel. I'm from Kentucky um, in the US. My question kind of pertains to the technology side of um, taking photos and videos because 
Um, for me, when I'm watching something that's been filmed, my first question in my head is, oh, how did they capture that shot? And it seems like a lot of times there's this really cool technology like drones and Federico, it seems like you're using a big, heavy red camera. But do you ever find that the advancement in technology kind of takes away from your opportunity to get the shot? Because especially when filming wildlife, I think you'd have to set up really fast and get moving really fast to capture that shot. So I was curious um, if you ever find that these big advancements are impeding your ability to get it rather than helping? That's a, an amazing question. And it's definitely one that the industry revolves around constantly. And oddly enough, yes, technology is getting better and better and better, but cameras are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's, that's weird. Now we have to carry hundreds of pounds into the forest to film monkeys. Anyways. Um, but what I was going to say is cameras are tools. And depending on what you're going to film, you, you need different tools. Yes, if you want to film monkeys or snow leopards that are super far away and you want to capture them on the low light, with big lenses, you maybe want to have a big camera. But if you want to have a, a hummingbird feeding on a humming, um, on a bird feeder, of your window maybe your phone camera lens adapter will allow you to hang the phone right off the the bird feeder to capture the hummingbird coming right off up to you and feeding there or a gopro i was just swimming uh, like malika showed the photo in these beautiful amazonian creeks and uh the gopro is fantastic to do underwater photography so when i approach a story or a subject or an idea i tend to think what are the tools that are going to help me accomplish that goal if I want to get the super far animal, yeah, maybe I need a big lens. If I want to do something that's closer to me in a rough environment that needs action shots, maybe a DSLR. If I just want to get down and dirty in the model, the water or something, maybe a GoPro. So don't get too bogged down by the technical aspect. We love it. We do it all the time. But remember, these are tools that will help you tell your story better. Sure. And the tool sure. without the craft, it's no tool. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, building on what Federico said, um, sometimes people often have this misperception that, you know, you kind of have to have an, an enormous camera to be able to take a great photograph. But I think almost every single amazing photographer that I've met um, and spoken with will tell you that when they started out, they had a really small camera. They had a basic, basic camera. And that's all you need because it is about the story you're telling. It is about the composition. It's about the lighting. It's about the subject. It's about how much effort you put into the photograph. So I think that as you get better, you know, the cameras will get better and more exciting. But when you're starting, I don't think you need to worry about about that you know as much um, I often think that having a camera that's really accessible and easy to use is amazing so I use the Panasonic GH5 which is great for video and photo and the, the benefit of doing that is kind of when I'm filming undercover it passes off as like a consumer tourist camera so that you know if I'm filming stories that are slightly controversial where I can't you know pretend I can't say that I'm a filmmaker using this particular small camera allows me to get in and you know take photographs so I think like Federico said thinking about what the final output is and what you need to tell the story and then working backwards from there is the way to think about equipment. Thank you. Thank if we could actually stick with you, Malika, for just a second, we got a question in the chat from Seth, and he wants to know whether or not the folks that you feature in some of your photos know that uh, the fishing that they're doing as part of their trade is illegal. Um, and, you know, I think a, another part of that question is, like, how do you process the fact that, you know, they are doing this for their uh, livelihood uh, while also threatening these creatures that we want to protect? So I think the most important thing that I've learned in the last couple of years, and I didn't honestly think this initially, um, is that the fishermen aren't the bad actors. They are not the people who are evil or bad. I mean, honestly, they're just people who want to put three meals on the table for their families, right? Um, and when I'm taking a photograph and when I'm taking a video for some of my documentaries, I try to get that empathy coming out by not just going in there and being like, hey, you know, what you're doing is wrong, but asking them, why do you do what you do? Um, do you have other 
options. Um, why don't you have other options? Because I'm honestly a big fan of solution space journalism and solution space filmmaking. So if I can understand what the you know the gap is or what they can't access right now that is forcing them to be traffickers and forcing them to be fishermen, then maybe I can help connect them with grassroots organizations that can give them the right support and resources. And that's what we have been doing in part. But yeah, I completely um, think that as a storyteller, when you're documenting issues that are kind of contentious, where, you know, the people are good, good people, but they're also endangering an animal, it's important to kind of tell both sides of the story so that your audience understands that, you know, no one's a villain here. Everyone's working um, just to feed their families. Folks are operating within a system that forces unfortunate choices. And so that kind of underscores the importance of the work that you're doing, Malika, to bring that system to light. Um, sure. Also kind of, you know, it's not just about taking the photograph that, you know, the one that you saw earlier where the fisherman's on a boat killing a manta ray. But if you watch the documentary, I mean, later on you see the fisherman with his family and you see the fisherman walking in a beach and worried about how climate change is impacting his oceans. So when you kind of see it from his perspective and not just, you know, from the animal conservation perspective, I think that makes a big difference. This is all about empathy and that's what we're trying to pursue here. Um, okay, we have about nine minutes left. Federico, I would love it if you could, um, for a moment, uh, review some of the photos that uh, were submitted as part of last week's assignment that uh, Asha and Erica really identified as being uh, some of the best. Yes, I would love to. Do yeah, I think we have 12 photos that we're gonna review and um, as soon as they're up, we'll start. So last year, last week's theme was connection and uh, students focused on images that showed this element. Um, let's see them. Um, ooh. So this image, um, I remember reading the notes, they picked it because of the element of shadow and uh, the contrast, the colors, that you can see how the person is uh, there, but not necessarily there. So it's a little bit of a back and forth, a connection that it's not necessarily too obvious, right? Um, in this one, we have um, a gentleman that's by Matthew Clifton um, that has some very nice, even light, nice distance from the person. And you can see that uh, a little bit of the environment, the house, the tree, but it's a portrait. And you can tell that the man is relaxed because of his face. So that's good. Comfort is good. In the next one uh, by Antonia Villan Villanueva, we have a great composition, the duality and the frame with the door of the girl and the guy and the tension of the hands. Uh, it's, it's all it's very complete. It's nice that the hands are holding and it creates a sense of power and unity. So, and the deliberate attention to the camera also picks our attention as the audience. In the next image uh, submitted by Shri Po Miatin, sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Um, we love the idea of using archive. It's very creative and very sensitive to show the connection of the photographer to, to his or her family, and uh, especially to the father who's no longer alive. So um, using archive and looking into memories with current technology, it's also a really nice way to uh, connect. The next image submitted by John Juhas, um, something more recent, uh, the protests in the United States. And um, the people on the ground holding hands in the moment show the coming together for a singular cause. So that's very powerful. And um, it's also nice that we see different races together showing solidarity. So connecting, holding hands, different races, all of us together for one cause. So that's, that's very powerful of this image. The black and white also works well. In the next image uh, submitted by Toriso Nguatuane, um, it's a beautiful moment. It's very sweet. Three uh, girls having a painting together and uh, it shows childhood, it shows some shows some innocence, friendship. So there's different ways to connect. And not necessarily, we always have to be up close with our subject. It can be an intimate scene that we photograph from behind or from a little bit away. Um, in the last, in the next image, submitted by Shivani Diwan, 
Um, it's a very nice composition. We see some nice lines, some nice squares and shapes, textures, and the exposure is perfect. Um, and we see the connection between the woman and the food. It reminds us what she's telling and that we are all connected to, to food, to uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, so not only human connections are important and or on our assignment, we want you to work on the connectionship with nature. So look into that as well. And the last image, last but not least, submitted by Amal Dosa. Uh, it's a very nice balance between light and dark. And this creates a mood together with the uh, uh, raindrops in the window. So not seeing the person's face, we're also thinking about what's happening. It makes us think about this connection in a broader sense. Is he okay? Is she okay? Is she sad? Is she happy? So we can also connect through thoughts and this image and the contrast helps us do that. So thank you everyone who su submitted images. Thank you so much for this week's work. Yeah, and some of those images were so striking. So thank you to everyone who took the time to submit the assignment from last week. For those watching, go check out those Instagram handles. They seem like some really amazing photographers. I'll be following them myself. Um, and looks like we're running right up on time, but maybe we have time for just one more question, if that's okay with you all. Um, we had a question from uh, uh, Ankita. Uh, she asks, I'm curious as to what inspired you to shoot nature. And I think that's a nice question for us to end on. If you could each just speak a little bit as to kind of what is it that uh, led you to kind of dedicate your life to uh, conserving nature and the environment. Mal uh, Malika, why don't we start with you? Okay, um, so I actually grew up by the coast. I spent a lot of time windsurfing and diving and sailing and literally doing every kind of sport out there. So for me, it was the adventure sport that kind of drew me out into the outdoors and made me fall deeply, deeply in love with it. But the reason why I decided to, I wouldn't say dedicate because like that sounds very, very serious. But the reason I decided to, you know, be a wildlife filmmaker and it's one of the most fun jobs on the planet, I have to say, um, is because I realized that when I watch television, um, despite the fact that there was biodiversity loss, despite the fact that there was wildlife trafficking, despite the fact that there were all of these issues, when I watched TV, very often I saw, you know, lions fighting. And I thought that that wasn't enough. I really wanted people to be able to see stories of how the natural world is being impacted and how our generation of young people is having to face the consequences of this. And for me, that was the gap that I wanted to fill, fill as a storyteller and as a filmmaker. And that's why I got into wildlife filmmaking, photography, and storytelling. And for me, uh, simi similarly, the gap that I wanted to close was the one I found between rural communities or indigenous communities in Colombia, in South America, and me as a biologist. When I finished my degree as a biologist, I knew a lot about behavior, ecology, evolution. And I would travel to these remote places and tell the locals about this and they were like oh very interesting but we don't know we know nothing about that so i realized that there was a big disconnect between us as scientists and them as uh, locals or or yeah indigenous and it's not a bad gap i just wanted to bridge it so i thought i would be a better person if i work on the outreach side of things on com communication uh dissemination of science and nature and all of this rather than producing science so i think right now more than ever we need more voices, more storytellers, more action, uh, more people committed to share what's happening out there because as we've noticed, uh, things could be better and we have to make it better. And if it's not us, then I don't know who will do it. So let's all work together. And I think we definitely need more young people who you know, kind of take up space, own that space. I mean, we're not waiting for people to give us that space. We're going to take it. And which is why we need more young photographers and filmmakers telling their own stories. So if you are going out there as part of the assignment and taking a photograph of nature, know that you might be a beginner right now, but your story matters so much. And when you put it out there, you're going to actually take that story to so many other people's homes and people's lives and impact them. And that is the most inspiring thing in the world. 
there's, we could talk for hours. Before. We have so many questions that we were not able to get to. I just wanted to point out that we have folks joining us from over 13 countries today. Um, so if you all want to continue to follow Malaika and Federico's work, they're on Instagram. Uh, they are active. They follow them, follow their work. Um, but thank you to both of you again for joining us. And also thank you to everyone for watching. Um, remember to share about your experiences using hashtag PhotoCamp Live on Instagram uh, or uh, on Instagram and to use the link in the description of this video to submit your assignment for the week. The deadline for the assignments, if you are interested in getting your work reviewed by Malaika and Federico, is 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday. So submit your assignments by 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday. Uh, you can follow me and you can follow National Geographic at Inside Nat Geo. Uh, finally, and this is really important, I need everyone to be safe and follow public health guidelines uh, as you're shooting right now. We are still in the middle of a global pandemic and in the United States at least, things are getting worse. So I need everyone to stay safe and be smart. Um, so thank you for everyone. And if you're available next Tuesday, June 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern, please join my friend Sahar for the latest installment of Gen Geo Careers in Conservation. Uh, we will hear from educator and National Geographic explorer Kavita Gupta about the unique career paths that exist in education. Uh, and of course, I will see everyone here next week. Friday at 2 p.m. to hear from our next guests. Uh, but until then, ciao. Thank ciao. You. Bye. Good luck. <laughs>